today we have actually a special guest because he is also a collaborator of our mutual collaborator Reinhard Laubenbacher. So his name is Henrique Diasis Lopez Rivera. Henrique right now is a postdoctoral researcher at the Laboratory of Systems Medicine in a division of Palmatory Clinical Care and Sleep Medicine, University of Florida Health. So the primary research focus is on mathematical and computational modeling of the immune system. And his research interests include the use of agent-based modeling, ordinary differential equations, and Boolean networks. Now, Henrique is a biologist by training and completed a PhD in bioinformatics at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. And then he undertook two postdoctoral appointments in the institute in Rome, Italy, the institute I cannot pronounce. So Henrique, you will probably have to tell us later the full pronunciation. But during that period in Italy, he developed a computational model of immune response to cutaneous leishmaniasis. And after that, he moved to the Center for Quantitative Medicine at Yukon Health, where he developed another computational model of immune response to Aspergillus fumigatus. And this is when I actually first heard about Henrique um, at that center when I was visiting Center of Quantitative Medicine. And it was quite interesting what he was doing. And that is the reason I wanted to invite him to tell all of you what kind of cool things you can do with computational models in biology. And today we will hear about multi-scale mechanistic modeling of the host defense in invasive aspergillosis reveals hemorrhage as the driver of infectious outcome. And I hope I pronounced all the biology words correctly. <laughs> okay, Henrique, stage is yours. And let's welcome the speaker and let's hear about some interesting models. Okay. So um, let me share my screen here. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, so like Julia said, uh, my work is mechanistic, mode scale mechanistic modeling of the host defense in invasive aspergillosis reveals hemorrhage as the drivers of infection outcome. Um, so, oops. This presentation will be, we are, are going to be talking, will be divided in seven parts, seven small parts. A brief introduction about Aspergillus fumigatus and Aspergillosis, an overview of the model, its parameterization with a case study, uh, an example of how I get one of its critical parameter, not so critical, but one of the most challenging, as a matter of fact. Uh, the validation uh, study of uh, parameters, parameters importance, uh, some predictions that's where hemorrhage comes in in a brief conclusion. So for a very brief introduction, aspergillus, it's a common mold that in immunocompromised people, there is people, usually we are talking in, in people neutropenic, it can cause pneumonia and invasive aspergillosis. And this includes people uh, going on, undergoing chemotherapy for cancer, uh, undergoing organ transplant, and more recently, uh, people on ICU treatment for COVID-19. Uh, and when you have uh, invasive aspergillosis, the rate of death is between 50 to 90%. However, uh, immunocompetent uh, hosts and people are not uh, on risk of, to develop this disease. So the model, 
the biology of the model encoded in this model. It always starts with a conidia coming into the lung. This is a resting conidia, which is invisible to the immune system. After around four hours, this conidia swell and becomes visible to immune system. And after a while, it starts to germinate and form hyphae, such as this structure seen in this slide here. This swelling co swell conidia and the hyphae, they activate resident uh, macrophages and epithelial cells uh, in the lung to secrete cytokines and chemokines that attracts more leukocytes such as monocytes and neutrophils and then kill the hyphen and the swelling conidia. Uh, in immunocompetent people, there is very little germination. Usually the swelling conidia, it's killed before it even germinates. Uh, in parallel to that, the fungi needs iron for its metabolism. So it secretes siderophores that are molecules that uh, chelates iron from uh, serum carrier molecules transferring and then it uptakes back the siderophore bound to iron and the, uh, the host secretes IL-6 in response to the, the fungi and the IL-6 instructs the liver to produce the hormone hepcidin that instructs the, 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 the body to decrease the levels of transferring both free and bound to iron. So we have two processes here. We have this battle for iron between the host and the fungi. And we have this uh, traditional direct fight between the immune system and the fungi. So this is the biology encoded in this model. Uh, we have uh, some simple models of the cells in this, um, in this simulator. Ideally, we would like to have uh, detailed intracellular models of the cells, such as uh, Boolean networks for the macrophages, the epithelial cells, something like that, something like a Boolean network or, or even a, a Agent, uh, ODE model of the genes activation. However, at present, we don't have that. Instead, we have this uh, model of discrete states of the cells. In uh, the paragon cell is the macrophage or monocytes as a marrow. Actually, it's the monocyte. So the cells, they start uh, as a re in the resting state upon some signal, for example, swelling conidia, hyphae or TNF alpha, they move to the active state, but first they pass through an intermediate activating state that accounts for the delay between resting and active. And when they are active, they secrete cytokines. And upon further activation with TNF alpha, they also secrete uh, chemokines. Uh, there are some literature that hints that uh, uh, cells need extra activation for secret chemokines. There are hints on the literature. There are hints also in, on CAG about this extra activation step. And uh, this part, this part on the ellipsis, this works for all the cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and epithelial cells. This part outside the ellipsis, it's exclusive for macrophages or monocytes, actually. We, we don't differentiate very much between macrophages and monocytes in this model. Uh, so upon uh, priming with apoptotic neutrophils, IL-10 and TGF-beta, they move to inactive, which is just a word for anti-inflammatory or sometimes this is also called M2C. And in this state, they secrete TGF beta. So this, this uh, nomenclature inactive, this comes from a, 
from a review from Gordon from 2003. Nowadays, this is called more frequently N2C or anti-inflammatory. And the macrophages, particularly, they can only kill the high phage when they are active. The neutrophils, they don't have this restriction. So this is uh, how we model our cells. Now, how we, in this slide, we have an overview of the model as a whole. The model is, uh, the, the agent-based model is a discrete model in time and space. It's a 3D model. Here we are presenting a 2D uh, overview of the model for simplicity, for convenience. So it's a grid. We initialize it with some cells and some conidia. And when two agents, for example, a epithelial cell and a conidia are in the same voxel, they can interact. And upon interaction, cells got activated. And upon activation, they secrete cytokines and chemokines. And these molecules then diffuse through the space according to a partial differential equation. Then the leukocytes, such as monocytes, they move through the gradient of chemokines. And the overall concentration of chemokines, it's used to recruit more leukocytes, such as neutrophils. So this recruitment it's uh, recruitment from outside the simulated space. So in terms of, of uh, uh, the simulation, this is actually creation of new agents because we are bringing something from outside. So we, we do this by creation, creating new agents, uh, proportional more or less to the concentration of chemokines. So this is an overview of the model, how it works, how we show how we model the, the cells, we show how we model it in, in its tissue level. And we submit recently a paper to the Journal of the Royal Society interface with this model. I think it's also in the bioarchive. We, we, I think we put it today on the bioarchive, actually, uh, where we we describe all 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 this all that I presented here, and also some some we made some predictions and some validation, which is what I'm going to show here. So, this model it's. Somewhat, compl somewhat complex, it has lots of parameters, which is what I'm showing here, it has around 75 parameters. However, we got all these parameters from the literature. So all these numbers here in this table, this is a reference from a paper in which we use to estimate a, parameters, a parameter. Uh, some of these parameters we have a very good estimate. Some of them is no more than educated guess. But nevertheless, we got all of them from, from a priori, from the literature. And now I'm going to show you how I got one of these parameters. It's probably not the most critical one. However, it's the most, I believe, the most interesting and the most one of the most challenging one. And, and that's why I choose this one. Um, however, for me to, to show how I got this parameter, we, we need some background first. Uh, even for me to say what this parameter is, I, I need to, to give you some background. So a few years ago, our group, pres uh, published a Boolean network of iron acquisition and uh, oxidative stress response for Aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, so in this network, 
Aspergillus fumigatus acquire iron from reductive, it has reductive iron acquisition represented by this Fe3 plus arrow here and siderophore iron acquisition represented by this TFC, TFC is the siderophore, uh, by this TFC arrow here. They, they both lead to this LIP, which stands for labio iron pool. And uh, this is, these arrows, they are a little bit more complicated. They have this format here. Uh, so I will not concentrate on, on reductive iron acquisition because this is not the main form of, of iron acquisition. There are papers showing that uh, siderophore iron acquisition is the dominant form on, on during the infection. So the TFC for, for, for the, the fungi acquire iron via, via TFC, it needs TFC, it needs mere B, which is the receptor for TFC, and SB, which is the protein that process TFC inside the, the cytoplasm of the, the fungi. Well, very well, this, this was a bullet network, uh, was a standalone work. We modified this bullet network for, so that it could work in the context of an uh, agent based model. So the first thing we did was to break that arrow from TFC to LIP. So as you can see here, we have an arrow here you can see the cursor of my, my, my cursor, right? Uh, you have yes, a, we, yes, we can see the cursor. Yeah. Okay. You have an arrow here from TFC to LIP. And here uh, we don't have this arrow anymore. Instead, we have this arrow here, which means that when this node is on, I secrete TFC with some rate, which I come from the literature. There, there were people who measure the TFC secretion rate from this fungi. Then TFC reacts with transferrin on the environment and becomes TFC-BI and it's uptake by the fungi. And there is also people who measure the TFCBI. TFCBI is TFC bound to iron. There were, were people who measured TFC bound to iron uptake rate by the fungi. And then uh, I have a iron pool, which is some amount of iron, in, I don't know, in micromolar of iron inside this fungi cell. Uh, but then we have a problem because I have this amount of iron in micromolar, but the labio iron pool here, it's Boolean variable. And to communicate these two numbers, one is a real number, the other is a Boolean. I come up with this activation function. This activation function, it's, it's a phenomenological equation. It's, it's just an equation that I, I create to transform a real number into a Boolean number. It's purely phenomenological. Uh, and then, well, okay. But then I have this parameter here. I, I call it K iron here. It's a sort of KD. And I have to estimate this KD. But then we, we have a problem here because um, this parameter it sort of exists only so far as I created it. Uh, TFC secretion rate, well, it, it exists on its own. As soon as an uh, organism secretes something, it has a rate with which it secretes something. But this, this KD here, it's, 
it it exists exists only so far as I choose to model this with this in in this way. And I mean, how would someone have would have measured that? Would have measured something that that I create? Do, do you understand the, the the problem here? However. I will show that with some ingenuity, we can find someone who quote unquote measure that. Uh, okay. So this paper here, they made, oh, let me, let me return, let me explain one more thing here uh, that will become important. There is a, a feedback, negative feedback loop in this network between this gene here, SREA, and the receptors of TFC, mir B. When the labiorum pool is on, it activates this gene, SREA, who inactivates mir B, and then the fungi stops acquiring iron because the, the fungi doesn't have the, a mechanism to export iron. So when it has enough, it has to stop acquiring iron. So in this paper here, they make knockout of this gene, SREA. I don't know if that's the pronouns, but anyway, bear with me. Uh, they make knockouts and grew the fungi in TFC bound to iron. This is the wild type and this is the knockout and they grew the fungi in, 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 in media containing sideroport bound to iron. And after a while, they, after 24 hours, they measure the concentration of iron on the colonies in micromoles per gram of dry weight. And using some, some papers, I could make the conversion from dry weight to wet weight. And I know based on this paper and also based on other papers that these two colonies grew equally. So this is a important thing. So um, I will model the increase of iron in these two colonies. And I claim that this will give me the, that parameter I invented. Um, let's see how, how I can do that. There is a, a few assumptions I'm doing here. And as I, I move through the, the modeling, I'm I will talk about them. So the quantity of iron in the, in the knockout colony can be given by this equation here. And here's the first assumption that the iron the colony uptake, it's neglectable compared to the quantity of iron in the environment. So this TFC here, uh, that's the TFC on the environment doesn't change a lot. It stays more or less constant. And, and this here, HT is the, is the equation that controls the growth of the colony. So the quantity of iron on the knockout colony is given by this and that's where we stop. Uh, I don't know what H of T is, so we stop here. But let's move on for the wild type colony. The wild type colony is given by this, and we have this S of uh, iron on the wild type colony. And uh, this at first is unknown, but uh, I decided long ago that this is that activation function. So this is the 
complement of that activation function. Why? Why this is the complement of that activation function? Because I am looking to the, this is a little bit philosophical. I'm looking to the world through the glasses of my modeling. So then I am imposing my model here. Then this becomes this. Then I can do some rearrangements. And now something inter interesting happens here because these two are equal. And then I can substitute here. And I have a C uh, integration constant, which I can find to be the KD. And, and now there is another uh, supposition I made here that the, the initial quantity of iron in the colonies, it's neglectable. It's actually not zero. I know it's not zero, but I'm assuming it's neglectable. And I think this is a, a reasonable supposition. And then I found this and this F of WT and F of KO are no known quantities from the experiment. And then I I found I can found that that uh, that KD I invented. So there is this mathematical I make here and I found that that parameter that's very phenomenological, that very phenomenological parameter that I created that no one would ever measure. And here it is. If you use a little bit of math, you can find it hided behind some experimental procedure. But then does it work? And, and does all this, this, this math work? Does this reproduce uh, literature? Does this reproduce experimental procedure? Then we come to validation. We, first got uh, some time series from literature, literature that we did not use to, to parameterize the model. And we compare with predictions from the model. So this is novel literature from neutrophils, CFU, TNF-alpha, IL-6. And we see a, a good fit here. Uh, you can see a, a little bit of mismatch. However, the level of mismatch between our model and the literature is comparable to the level of mismatch between the literature and the literature itself. We are going to show this uh, momentarily. Here is fit of our model with data we generated. However, this is only the timing we are fitting here because this is uh, two axis. And uh, here we are showing that uh, the data, the timing of the data is correct. It's correct, not, nothing else. And here we are comparing the literature with itself, like I, I told you. So you can see that the literature has a somewhat huge variation. Uh, different papers uh, report somewhat different values. And here we plot this. So this first bar here is the value from the literature, different papers. It's a thick bar. The second bar is our uh, is our simulator, and you can see that our simulator is within the range of the literature. And the third bar is our simulator run with Latin hypercube sampling. So we run 1,200 simulations with sampling the parameters with Latin hypercube. And we found that uh, the simulator could more or less reproduce even the 
variance from the literature in this case. Then we did, uh, in this paper, we did some analysis of uh, how the parameters can explain uh, the burden, uh, fungal burden, because in the end of the day, that's what clinicians are interested, uh, what leads to, to spread of the infection to fungal burden, especially in monocompromised uh, hosts. And first and foremost, the intrinsic growth rate, not surprisingly. So that's kind of a bummer. I mean, growth explain growth. Um, so for example, when the growth rate was, the intrinsic growth rate was uh, uh, low, this comes from a, uh, this, this table here is a, is a summary of, a, of classification trees. When the, the growth rate was low, uh, we had 1.5% germination in immunocompetent hosts and 6.9% germination in, in neutropenic. When it was high, according to the classification trees, we had 83% germination in immunocompetent, high along with other parameters and high along with other parameters in neutropenic, we had 271% germination in neutropenic. So high along with, for example, low recruitment rate, uh, high swelling rate and high siderophore secretion rate lead to 271% germination. I mean, germination plus a little bit of growth. Of course, you can have 200% germination. But this is germination plus uh, growth. Uh, but this these results come from trees like that. And this first branch here is growth. So you can see that growth dominate overall the parameters growth explains almost everything growth is it's it's dominant so we decided to to see how the other parameters uh, how are the importance of the other parameters the other top parameters uh, in strains of fungi with different growth rate. So for example, here we have what we, you could call different strains of fungi with different growth, growth rate. For example, in this uh, stream left here would be a fungi with an uh, intrinsic growth rate about 10 micrometers per hour. And in this other uh, extreme, you would have a fungi with a growth rate of 90 micrometers per hour, almost 10 times, nine times as, as higher. Eight, nine times as high. And we see that when the intrinsic growth rate is very small, the swelling rate there is when the fungi start swelling, uh, does it swell very fast or does it take very long to swell? The swelling rate, it's not very important. It does not correlate very much with fungal burden. When the growth rate is very high, the swelling rate correlates 
seems to correlate more with fungal burden. Now, TFC is the opposite. When the fungal growth is very small, TFC secretion rate correlates with fungal burden. And when it's very high, it doesn't correlate a lot. And, and there is a simple explanation for that. Uh, swelling rate is a double-edged sword. It's the first step into growth, but it's also when the fungi reveal itself to the immune system. So if you, if you are growing very slowly and if you swell, you are, the swelling become the first step into death because you are going to swell and become a swelling conidia, which is susceptible to the immune system. Then it's the first step into death. If you are growing very fast, you are going to swell and very, very quickly you will grow, will become a hyphae and hyphae is more resistant to the immune system. Then swelling is really the first step into growth. And that's why uh, there is this, this swelling is more important, more correlated with growth when the fungi is growing fast. In TFC, there is a, a cooperativity. When you have very little uh, cells, you have a very uh, low concentration of TFC. And then the cells doesn't ha don't have access to iron and to TFC. They then they have to secrete more to compensate for that. When, when you have a lot of cells, the concentration, there are a lot of cells secreting TFC and the concentration is higher. Uh, okay. Then we have a second paper in production, which is uh, the hemorrhaging stuff. Uh, well, this paper that I just present to you, it uh, only reproduced the very early onset of the infection, but if you extend, if we extend it to two days, three days of infection, it doesn't reproduce very well um, what happens in the infection. And that's what we are showing this picture here. So in this plot on the right is the, what happens in the host in a neutropenic mice. Uh, the biomass of the fungi in the lung of a neutropenic mice grows exponentially uh, after the infection starts. However, in our, in our simulation, uh, the blue curve predi uh, predicts that the infection, the biomass of the fungi decreases with time. So, a naive model predicts the, that even in a neutropenic mice, the infection should be controlled. Well, that's a stark contrast with, uh, with the experiments, with the reality. And then that's when, when we come, not just we, but the, the experimentalists with which we work, work uh, they come with this hypothesis, both them and we come with the hypothesis of the hemorrhaging, which says that uh, the fungi can uh, take iron from, from him. And they, when the fungi starts to grow into hyphae, they puncture the lung. Uh, which release blood into the lung, releases erythrocytes. These erythrocytes, they burst, releasing him, releasing hemoglobin. Hemoglobin eventually releases him, and the him is uptake by the fungi. And this uptake, him uptake by the fungi, was recently confirmed by ex by experiment doing by. Uh, our team of experimentalists. Uh, in parallel, 
hemoglobin and heme uh, bound to haptoglobin and hemopexin respectively, and these complexes inhibit macrophages. Uh, so we have two processes here. We have iron supplementation and we have macrophage inhibition. And we did a very phenomenological, at first we did a very phenomenological uh, model of this in which erythrocytes inhibits macrophages and erythrocytes burst and releasing iron that supplement the, the fungi. Very phenomenological, very simple. Uh, that was the first attempt. And we test the two, the two mechanisms in separate, in macrophage inhibition and iron supplementation. When we test macrophage inhibition, we have a very modest uh, fungi growth, but still was a, was a sort of exponential growth, modest. You have to take into account that this is a logarithm scale. When you take into account iron supplementation or both processes, iron supplementation is this dotted curve here and both processes, the dark curve, we have a very aggressive infection. So uh, this phenomenological model could reproduce the, uh, the outcome we see in the experiments. But then we, now we are moving to a more uh, mechanistic model. And surprisingly, we are working in something that is make more mechanistically, but also very simple. We have experimental evidence that uh, in the blood, there is already heme, free heme in the blood. We don't need to account for erythrocyte burst and hemoglobin release heme and all this stuff. There is already heme into the blood. So the fungi punctures the lung, like I said before, then heme and hemopexin starts to flow into the alveolus and the uh, the fungi starts to uptake heme and in parallel heme and hemopexin react and inhibits macrophages. So we, we still have to, the two processes and uh, but with this slightly more mechanistic model we could reproduce a experiment of hemopexin knockout mice. And what I would like to call your attention here is for these, these two sets of dots here. So this experiment is, uh, those are neutropenic mice, but the one, the, the, uh, the right box, it's hemopexin knockout in the left box. It's wild type. I mean, it's still neutropenic, but it, uh, it has hemopexin. It's wild type for hemopexin. And uh, in the right box, I, uh, the, the, the thick box is here these thick boxes. It's just that this, this experimental dots here uh, plotted all, all over again. So these two boxes here, these thick boxes here is, are, are the same as these blue boxes here that I highlighted here, okay? Uh, and these thin boxes are uh, simulation predictions. So here's what happened when I, I let the simulator, uh, I simulated a mice with hemopexin and here's what happened when I simulated a mice 
without hemopexin. And this is interesting because um, this is not trivial because um, when I uh, remove hemopexin, the amount of iron available for the fungi increases. However, I also uh, decrease the macrophage inhibition. So I have two uh, contradictory processes here. For one side, I am increasing the, the nutrient for the fungi. But on the other hand, I am uh, also making the immune system more strong, stronger, making the immune system stronger. So uh, what is more important? According to the experiments, according to the experiments, uh, increasing the nutrient, uh, it's more important. And according in, and the simulator agrees. The simulator says yes. Uh, if you increase the iron, this this uh, the infection will will take over more aggressively. Uh, so we we were able in the end we were able to reproduce this this experiment at least qualitatively. Uh, so in conclusion, we created and validated a model of immune response to Aspergillus fumigatus. This model predicts that hemorrhage is the reason why macrophages in the absence of neutrophils can control the infection. And it reproduced hemopexin knockout, data of hemopexin knockout mice. And um, uh, this is the people involved in this project from the Laboratory of System Medicine, uh, Dr. Luis Sordo Vieira, Dr. Adam Knapp, Dr. Luis Fonseca, Dr. Matthew Wheeler. And those are the other people from the lab that were not directly involved with this project. This is a not so up-to-date photo of the people in the lab. And I would like to thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Henrika. This was actually quite interesting. And uh, let's just thank the speaker and see if we have questions. Any questions, anybody? Okay, I'll try to ask. It's not really a question, it's just a curiosity I have. <laughs> So it's about macrophages. So you said at the beginning you don't differentiate. Um, so I, I know that in some studies it has been shown that um, so the pro-inflammatory macrophages, they uh, basically display uh, iron retention. But these anti-inflammatory macrophages, they display iron release. Do you think that's important in a lung or it's just tissue specific, I'm just curious about. Um, that, that it's interesting point. I, I do take that in account. Uh, when the macrophages are pro-inflammatory, I make them uh, retain iron. Mm -hmm. it, uh, there's two things in my model that makes them retain iron is when they are activated, which is a, another word for pro-inflammatory, and when they are primed by hepcidin, that hormone produced in the liver. Mm -hmm. this, these two signals, they both lead to iron retention. Okay, so it, it is part of your model because I was wondering how that works. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, when you say uh, macrophage inhibition, what exactly do you mean by that? Oh, uh, I'm just trying to understand from the modeling perspective what's going on inside. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I created a third state, which I call, maybe, maybe I didn't need to do that. Maybe I will actually change that in the future. But for now, I create a third state, which I called allergic 
which is similar to the anti-inflammatory state, except that they don't do anything. They don't secrete anything. They don't kill hyphae. They, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like an anti-inflammatory macrophage, but they, that they not even secrete TGF beta. But that okay. that's a uh, ongoing. Uh, uh, we will probably review that in the future. Okay. Uh, something else I had. Oh yes, what is this light and hypercube simulator? <laughs> I'm just curious. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, this, is a, this is a way to sample, to generate uh, uh, sets of random numbers that are completely independent of one another. Okay, I see. Um, I might have more questions, but we can discuss this later because it's going to be all iron related since you know I work in iron on iron models myself so um that might be more um between two of us <laughs> then but as the general questions um so you don't think that mac yeah i guess you you do take this into account that macrophage releasing iron does also contributes to the uh growth of the fungus i guess Oh, that's that's actually a uh, very important thing in very very in the beginning in the model uh, um, really really in the beginning uh, macrophages were releasing iron and this was promoting fungal growth but this was really really I don't know, my first two months doing like three years ago, my first two months doing this work. And I noticed that macrophages, the way I was uh, programming the macrophages, they were releasing iron. And this iron they were releasing was more helping the fungi to grow. Mm -hmm. so this, is, this is very true, what you, what you ask. Cool. Okay. Uh, anybody have questions? No more questions? Well, I would like to thank you, Henrique, again. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording since we can just chat. Mm -hmm.